But Morgoth himself, the Valar, thrust through the door of night, beyond the walls of the world, into the timeless void, and a guard is set forever on those walls, and Eorendil keeps watch upon the ramparts of the sky. Yet the lies that Melkor, the mighty and accursed, Morgoth Bauglir, the power of terror and of hate, sowed in the hearts of elves and men, are a seed that does not die and cannot be destroyed. And ever and anon it sprouts anew, and will bear dark fruit even unto the latest days. Greetings and well met, my friends. Yoiston here, and I hope you all are doing well, wherever you are in Middle-earth. Today we will be discussing the last events of the First Age and wrapping up the events of the Quenta Silmarillion, the history of the Silmarils. In our next episode of the Timeline of Arda, we will begin the events of the Second Age, the start of the Akalabeth, and the time of Numenor, as well as the events leading up to the creation of the Rings of Power. I have had so much fun exploring the Elder Days with you all during this series, and it's kind of sad that we have made it to the end of the First Age, since we've been doing this series for quite a few years now. I really love the Silmarillion and would recommend everyone read it. If you are new to this series or need a refresh, please check out the beginning of the Timeline of Arda series and our latest episode, both of which are linked in the description and cards, as well as some articles that helped with today's video and some other supplementary videos. In this video we will look broadly at the Fall of Gondolin, but for more details on how it happens in the Silmarillion, I'll link my Fall of Gondolin videos as well. As always, my friends, thank you all so much for joining me on this adventure. Let's begin our tale. We'll pick up where we last left off with Tur, Turin's cousin, who had seen Turin on his way to Gondolin with his guide Veronwe. Tur and Veronwe came to Gondolin around 496 of the First Age to deliver the message of Olmo the Vala to King Turgon, who was then the High King of the Noldor. This message stated that Turgon and his people should leave Gondolin and flee to the Havens of Sirion while there was yet time. In his pride and arrogance, even as he pondered all of the words Olmo had ever spoken to him, Turgon decided not to leave Gondolin, but rather to block up the secret gate, allowing none to leave or enter the city, for he feared treason. After the Nurnaith Arnoidiad, Turgon and his people were done mingling in the affairs beyond their encircling mountains, so when word came from Thorondor, the Lord of Eagles, to Turgon of the destruction of Nargothrond, the ruin of Doriath and the slayings of Thingol and his grandson Dior, he vowed not to march alongside the Sons of Fain or evermore, nor would he intervene in the outside world. And so it was, the people of Gondolin stayed put, and Morgoth continued to search for the city, the last city of elves that gave him pause and any sense of foreboding. Morgoth's spies were not successful, knowing only the general region of Gondolin by the words of Hurin, who had come to the encircling mountains seeking Turgon, his friend of old. As we said in the last episode, Hurin turned away. His nephew Tur had, however, fulfilled his duty to deliver the message of Olmo to Turgon, so Tur stayed within the city, having a love for the Eldar and their lore. Soon he fell in love with the elf maiden Idril, daughter of King Turgon, and they wed, being the second union of elves and men. Tur won the hearts of all elves in that land, except for Maeglin, who was the nephew of King Turgon, the son of Eor the Dark Elf, and Turgon's sister Erethel. Maeglin had a dark love for his cousin Idril, and that will soon come into the story. In 503, Eärendil was born, as was his future wife, Elwing of Doriath. Eärendil would be the light that sprung from the houses of Hur and Turgon, as foretold by Hur during the Nurnaith Arnoidiad. For a time there was happiness in Gondolin, even as in those years the second kinslaying occurred in Doriath, destroying that realm and forcing the Silmaril within the Nauglamir to go with Elwing to the Havens of Sirion. But in 509, Maeglin, who had passed beyond the leaguer of the king and defied his laws, was captured by the servants of Morgoth. The elf was tortured, but after being promised lordship over the vassal of Gondolin and the possession of his cousin Idril, he gave up the location of the hidden elven city through treachery. So in 510, even as a darkness grew upon Idril's heart and Maeglin had returned to the city to lead the assault secretly from within, the fall of Gondolin took place. Dragons of the brood of Glarong, Balrog's wolves and orcs came up and attacked the city. During the assault, Torgon and his most loyal servants, Ecthelion and Glorfindel, would meet their ends. But Gothmog, a lord of the Balrogs, would also be slain by Ecthelion. 
The death of Torgon would cause the High Kingship of the Noldor in Middle-earth to pass on to him who would be the final High King, Arenion Gilgalad, son of either Fingon or Orodreth. Maeglin, during the assault, would lay his hands on Eärendil and Idril, but Tor would see Maeglin thrown from the ramparts of the city, killing him in the same way his treacherous father Eol died, for Eol had cursed Maeglin to meet the same fate. After freeing his wife and son from Maeglin, Tor, Idril, and Eärendil escaped the city with the other refugees by way of a secret path that Idril's wisdom had seen created in the years prior. During their escape, Glorfindel would have his legendary fight with a Balrog, which would see his death. The refugees would escape to the Havens of Sirion, where had also gone the refugees from Doriath, and likely other lands as well. Morgoth reveled in his victory over Middle-earth, not fearing the sons of Feanor nor their oath. He rued not the loss of one Silmaril that had caused such destruction, and he either did not know or did not care about the Havens of Sirion, and the people that then dwelt there. Tor and Idril would eventually leave Middle-earth, passing out of our story, but their son Eärendil would marry Elwing at the Havens. Together they would have two sons, Elrond and Elros, in 532. In 534, Eärendil and his mariners set off in search of Valinor, knowing the only salvation of his people could come from the aid of the Valar and their people. Since Elwing retained the Silmaril, the Oath of Feanor would not subside, and the Sons of Feanor would commit the Third Kinslaying at the Havens of Sirion in 538. Elwing would flee with the Silmaril, jumping into the Great Sea, leaving her sons Elrond and Elros behind, to her sorrow. Amros and Amrod would be slain, leaving Mithros and Meglor as the last Sons of Feanor. Ulma would save Elwing and the Silmaril, giving her the form of a bird. She would go off and find Vingalot, the ship of Eärendil, her husband. Together and with their crew, Eärendil and Elwing would find the way to Valinor in 542. In the meantime, while both parents mourned their children who had seemed to be doomed, Elrond and Elros were actually adopted and raised by Maglor. Eärendil and Elwing went into Valinor together, stepping on lands immortal, sealing their fate while the crew stayed on the ship. Eventually, the crew would be sent back to Middle-earth, but having stepped foot on Valinor allowed not Eärendil and Elwing to do the same. Eanwe found Eärendil, while Elwing found her new friends, the Teleri of Alquilande. Eärendil was a man and Noldo both, as stated by Ulmo, and for those two reasons, Mandos wondered if he would go unpunished for coming to Valinor. In a council of the Valar, Eärendil pleaded on behalf of both children of Iluvatar, being half-elven himself, as was his wife Elwing. And it was through that selfless purpose of them coming to Valinor and pleading on behalf of elves and men that the Valar decided to aid the free peoples of Middle-earth. They decided that a choice of half-elves would be enforced also, beginning with Eärendil and Elwing. From then on, half-elves would have to choose whether or not to be judged as elves or as men. Both Eärendil and Elwing chose the former, to be judged as elves. Eärendil's ship Vingalot would be hollowed, allowing it to be sailed in the sky. Eärendil would go forth in the sky, with the Silmaril upon his brow, and he would be the evening star. Meglor and Mithros knew that his light was that of a Silmaril when they saw the new star, and that the Silmaril was beyond their reach for the whole world to see. His wife Elwing was given a tower to live in by the shores of Eldamar, and she learned how to transform into a swan to meet her husband in the sky. Now the host of the West would be formed, and it would be led by Aeonwe, the herald of Manwe. Others came also, such as the Vanyar, Ingwe's people, and the Noldor who remained in the uttermost West and followed Finarfin. Like I've mentioned in previous videos, I am unsure if the Valar themselves joined physically in the assaults, or if it was just their people. Concerning this issue, there are definitely arguments to be made on both sides, for it seems the strength of the Valar would be needed in the assault, but Aeonwe led the host, not Tulkas, who was the most warlike of the Valar. Back in Middle-earth, Morgoth did not think such a host would ever be formed against him, thinking that the divide between the Noldor and the Valar was too deep for any mending to ever happen. In my mind, that was Morgoth's critical flaw and final error, as he did not understand pity and mercy and goodness in the same way Manwe did not understand evil and chaos. And so it was that in 545, the host of Valinor landed and made war on Morgoth's armies of the north, 
The elves and fathers of men, who yet remained in Beleriand, took up arms with the West, while some other men, such as Easterlings, took up arms with Morgoth. And that would be something the elves would never forget. So great was the War of Wrath that it lasted through 587. While the war looked dire when, for the first time, Morgoth released the winged dragons, Eärendil and Thorondor, as well as Thorondor's eagles, came out of the sky and fought the dragon and Caligon the Black, the leader and largest of the winged dragons, and he was defeated. His fall broke the volcanic mountains then Gorodrim, and Morgoth had nothing else to do but flee and hide in the deepest of his mines. But he had the whole world after him. He sued for peace and pardon, but his feet were hewn out from under him, and his crown was beaten into a collar for his neck. He was bound with Engainor, a chain he wore in a different age of the world, and his reign of evil was ended. Most of Morgoth's Balrogs were slain, but some fled, as did some of his dragons and likely other creatures. The host of the West was victorious, and the two remaining Silmarils were retaken by Aeonwe, and the slaves of Angband were freed, although they saw a changed Beleriand. So great was the devastation of the war that Sirion was no more, and the lands were changed and broken. Aeonwe summoned the elves of Beleriand to depart, but Mithros and Meglor, great leaders and warriors of old, who had once had many followers, were now alone and weary of their oath. They would stand against Aeonwe, alone against the whole victorious host if they had to, for their oath demanded them retake the Silmarils from any who would withhold them. Aeonwe, of course, would not allow them to have the two Silmarils, not unless that was the will of the Valar. They would have to return west and abide the judgment of the Valar. Meglor desired to submit and do this, but Mithros saw how powerful their fell oath was, and how evil it had become. If the Silmarils were denied to them by the Valar, they could not possibly fulfill their oath in the west with war in Valinor. Meglor said, though, that perhaps if Manwë and Varda themselves denied the fulfillment of the oath, then would it not be void? Mithros said that they swore to Iluvatar in their madness, and that the everlasting darkness would take them if they fulfilled not their oath, so the Valar did not even have power to release them. Who then would release them? Meglor still argued against attempting to get the Silmarils back, saying they would do less evil in the breaking of their oath than in the fulfillment of it. But Mithros eventually convinced him, so they crept to where the Silmarils were being held, in Aeonwë's camp, and they slew the guards and took the Silmarils. The camp rose up against them, and they were ready to die, but Aeonwë would not permit them to be slain, so the last sons of Feanor fled. But the Silmarils of their father Feanor burned their hands due to their unholy deeds, so Mithros leapt into a fiery chasm with his, ending his life and taking the Silmaril into fire and earth. Meglor cast his Silmaril into the sea, doomed to wander alongside the waters, singing sad songs. Thus it was that the three Silmarils found their long homes of the earth, sea, and sky of stars. Earth slash fire, water, and air seemed to be common elements in the Silmarillion, for Aule, Ulmo, and Manwë were first to come into Arda to shape the world and those three realms. But one could argue that Eärendil's Silmaril is in the stars beyond the winds, and the stars themselves are another powerful element of Tolkien's works, and that is the realm of Varda. Anyway, a large part of the Noldor built ships on the shores of the Western Sea, and many of the Eldar set sail to the west, never to return. Some Noldor, who had once come to Beleriand in exile, returned and embraced once more the love of Manwë and Varda. They were forgiven by the Teleri of Alqualande for their past conflicts and they had their curse laid to rest. The Noldor of Valinor were subject still to Finarfin, and the Vanyar returned to their lives under the rule of Ingwe. However, the joy of the elves in victory was lessened, for the Silmarils would never come to them, not unless the world was broken and remade. But the Silmarils could also do no further harm in their long homes. But some of the Eldar had remained in Middle-earth, such as High King Gilgalad, Galadriel, Celeborn, Círdan, and Elrond Half-Elven, who chose to be an elf. Celebrimbor, the son of Cúdorfin, would also stay in Middle-earth, and he would play a large role during the Second Age. There are many other elves who decided to stay besides these, but we'll talk about them as they come up. 
Men were of course forced to stay also, not having the choice to go to Valinor. And the faithful who had fought alongside the host of the Valar during the War of Wrath would, in the early Second Age, be rewarded with the island of Numenor, and they would be taught long life by Aeonwe. Men followed King Elros, Elrond's brother who chose the fate of men, and who was descended from all three houses of the Edain. In the early Second Age, the dwarves of the Blue Mountains, who were of the Broadbeams and Firebeards, would migrate to be with the Longbeards of Casa Doom. But evil things remained in Middle-earth also, and the lingering legacy of Morgoth and the marring of Arda, as well as the lies of Melkor, were within elves and men thereafter, and Middle-earth would not forget him. The cold of the North would always be a legacy of his. Sauron, his lieutenant, who had put on a fair guise after the overthrow of Melkor, abjured for his evil deeds to his kin Aonwe. Some believe it was done truthfully, and Sauron at first actually repented of his evil, but possibly only out of fear. Aonwe could not pardon him, and he commanded Sauron to return to Valinor to receive the judgment of Manwe. Sauron was ashamed, unwilling to return in humiliation to receive a sentence, and under Morgoth his power had been great. So when Aonwe departed, Sauron hid himself in Middle-earth, and he went back to evil, for the bonds that Morgoth had laid upon him were too strong. Indeed, Sauron was perhaps the greatest and deadliest legacy of his master. Melkor himself was thrust through the door of night to be beyond the walls of the world in the timeless void in 590 of the First Age, the last year of that age. And a guard is ever set upon the walls, and Eärendil still keeps watch upon the sky. Melkor would never return to the world, except perhaps in the Dagor Dagoroth if one is to believe that battle will come. Finally, Beleriand itself was broken and submerged beneath the sea in 587. Those who remained in Middle-earth went east over the Blue Mountains to the lands we know from the Second and Third Ages. But some of Osiriand in East Beleriand survived, and it became Linden. The eastern part of the Blue Mountains, the Arid Luin, survived as well. Also, the graves of Turin Torambar and his mother Morwen, part of Dorthonion and the Hill of Hemring, would survive as the Western Isles of Tol Morwen, Tol Fuin, and Himling, respectively. There is debate as to how Beleriand sank and why, whether it was from the scars of the war that just made the land unstable, the breaking of the Thangorodrim, or perhaps the Valar sank it to heal the lands with water. We will talk about the early Second Age, new settlements and migrations into Middle-earth, as well as the rising of the island of Numenor in my next Timeline of Arda video. And so ends our tale about Beleriand, the First Age, and the Elder Days in our Timeline of Arda series. From these last events of the First Age, we see a simple but clear message. We must unite in a world that has chaos and evil, if we hope to endure for a better future. Things set into motion must find their ends indeed, but together, through understanding, we can hope to weather the storm and come to a time of peace afterwards. Thank you all so much for watching, I hope you all enjoyed this episode of the Timeline of Arda. If you did, please be sure to hit that like button and share this with a friend. Let me know your thoughts, questions, additions, and corrections about the end of Beleriand and the First Age in the comments below. For me, it is always great to see the end of Morgoth's realm and the transition from Beleriand into Middle-earth that we know from the Second and Third Ages, but it is always sad to leave behind the First Age and the Elder Days. I can see why Tolkien was so attached to them. But don't worry, we'll be back in the first stage for some other kinds of videos. Please check out our music channel, Facebook, Twitter, Merch, and Patreon for our Discord server and podcasts. Links are in the description below. I also wanted to give a shout out and thanks to our Valor tier patrons over on Patreon. Adrian Dilator, Chris Ortner, Peter Shepard, Kyle Wetzel, Lane Grimes, Mr. Bat Nadal, Samuel McBee, Jonathan Putnam, Kyrie Kawhi, and Felix Ellerm Norton. Thank you all so much. Finally, don't forget to subscribe and hit that bell button to join the Men of the West and all of the Free Peoples today, and I'll see you all again next week with a continuation of our What's Different series with the Two Towers. Everyone, as always, thank you all so much for joining me on this adventure. Until the next one, my great friends.